Okay, hello and welcome to another lecture of W102. Remember that your third homework is due this Friday at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. So let's review where we were last time. Last time we said that we have a system and if the system is LTI, then convolution is what adds structure to the output. So we can write the output Y as simply being a convolution of a system S with some impulse response H of T, this output is gonna be a convolution of the input to the system convolved with the impulse response. All right, that was the key finding from the last lecture. We ended last lecture also talking about some of the properties of convolution. So we had commutativity, associativity, et cetera. In this lecture, we're going to go a layer deeper into the properties. We're going to try to, you know, when possible, attempt to prove the properties. It might seem tedious when you can just memorize it, but we'll have a check your understanding question in the middle of the lecture that will ask you to actually write a proof. Also, uh, you know, some of the students posted on Piazza, there was a really good question about the difficulty of lectures not matching the difficulty of homeworks. I kind of agree, the homeworks uh, questions are more difficult than what we discuss in lectures. So today, what I'm gonna do at the end of lecture is I'll just cover one of the homework problems that I thought was a little bit difficult. Uh, and those of you who need more help, please feel free to come to the office hours uh, tomorrow, Wednesday. I'm actually doing this lecture at like two in the morning here on Wednesday morning. Okay, so commutativity. So, we may remember from high school, and this is a theme you'll see today, is a lot of the properties of multiplication also apply to convolution. So in particular, remember that if we have commutativity, we have some you know, number A times B, this is equal to B times A. So for example, three times four equals 12, which is equal to four times three. That's a simple example of commutativity in multiplication. The same property also holds for convolution, where in convolution, you might have a property such that, for example, the signal F star convolved with G is gonna equal G convolved with F. And this applies more generally as well. For example, if I have X convolved with H, this is gonna equal H convolved with X, okay? So this is the commutative property, and we're gonna go one layer deeper into this property by trying to prove that it holds for convolution. So in particular, let me write out y of t. So let's write pf is just short for proof. So the proof of this is let's pick some y of t and this is equal to x of t star h of t. So we'll assume this is our canonical system. x goes in to some system h to give me y. Now if this equation holds, then I should certainly be free to write the next line of this equation in integral form, minus infinity to infinity of x of tau, h of t minus tau, d tau. So nothing we've done should be complicated right now. This should all be review. We have written convolution in star notation, and then we have written it in integral form. Now our goal, if we were to do this successfully, is if I look at this equation in integral form, I wanna see that this equation, hopefully, is equal to Okay, 
I want to see that hopefully this is commutative, right? If it's commutative, then I can write this as h convolved with x, which gives me this integral form. So now our goal of this proof is going to be to take this blue equation and manipulate it, kind of work it like a piece of clay, so that it equals the integral form that I see in the red equation. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do variable substitution. So we're going to set sum tau prime equal to t minus tau. So why are we doing variable substitution? Well, if you look at the form of these two equations, the red and the blue, the difference is that h has two arguments in one of the equations, the blue equation, whereas it only has one argument in the red equation. So it's perfectly logical to use a dummy variable to actually swap this. So I'm going to set tau prime equals t minus tau. And now h will only have one argument in the blue equation, matching what we expect in the red equation. So let's say I set tau prime equals t minus tau. Then it also holds that d tau in this particular case, d tau prime equals minus d tau. And we can see that when tau equals minus infinity, then tau prime equals plus infinity. Likewise, when tau equals infinity, then tau prime equals minus infinity. And so in this case, if tau prime equals t minus tau, then tau t minus t prime, t minus tau prime. OK, very good. So now that I have variable substitution, what I can do is I can simply plug in variable substitution into the blue equation. So now what I do is I take the blue equation here, I apply the magenta variable substitution to get the following form. This equals the integral of minus, well, let me skip this first. Let me just write integral. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace tau, in this case, with t minus tau prime. So we can see that right here. Remember, we have an expression for tau. So we used to have x of tau. But if I apply the replacement with the underline, now I get x of t minus tau prime. So we just applied this replacement right here. All right, now if we apply this replacement here, we need to do the same thing to h. So h in this case is going to simply equal h of tau prime. Okay. So in this particular case, what we have done is we have replaced our integration variables. And therefore, the deep tau is now d tau prime. And if we change d tau to d tau prime, remember that d tau equals minus d tau prime, as shown here. Therefore, we need to put a negative sign out here. We also need to swap the limits going by these two equations here and here. And this is just integral substitution. So in this particular case, the limits are going to be swapped. So you're going to actually have minus infinity on the top and plus infinity on the bottom. OK, so in this particular case, we can further simplify. We can actually simplify this to the integral of minus infinity to infinity of h of tau prime x of t minus tau prime d tau prime. And the way I got to this equation was the first thing is I just swapped the order of these because this is multiplication. We know that multiplication itself is commutative. So I've just swapped the order to write h on the left hand side. More interestingly, to get the negative sign out and swap the limits, we have actually this relation. This relation holds in general. 
the integral from a to b of f of t dt equals minus b to a f of t dt. So we simply apply this property to go from this equality to this equality. So now if we look at this equality, this equality is nothing but h of t convolved with x of t. We see that this equation right here is exactly the convolution integral. The only difference is that we just have used a different variable. Instead of tau, we've used tau prime, but it's also an equally valid convolution integral. Therefore, what we have done is we've been able to go and show that here, x of t convolved with h of t is equal to h of t convolved with x of t. And that completes the proof. Because convolution is commutative for the flip and drag technique, For flip and drag, you can actually drag either h of t or x of t. So you have that choice. Even though in the lecture last time, we did it for h of t specifically, just for consistency, you are more than welcome to also have a recipe where you do it for x of t instead, right? It's mathematically equivalent. Okay. The next property that we'll discuss about convolution is stability. Remember that we discussed Bible stability, bounded input, bounded output, in one of the very early lectures. And stability takes the following form. Let's suppose we have some signal x of t, whose magnitude for all t is bounded by some constant m sub x. And m sub x is strictly less than infinity. So it's some constant that actually exists, right? So there's no value in the signal with a magnitude greater than mx. So there's no value of the signal that takes the form of infinity. So if I have this as my input to the system x, right? This is my input. And in our canonical system, we have y equals h of x. Then we say that the system h is stable if if the same property holds, right? If for any y of t, the magnitude is bounded by some constant my, which is less than infinity. So this is BIBO stability, bounded input, bounded output. Okay. And once again, we have our canonical system, x goes into h to give us y. So now our goal is to sort of, we'll do this together. This is a check your understanding together. Let's try to prove whether H is bounded. Let's prove whether H of T is also bounded. So my question to you sort of is if I know that the system is stable. Let's say that the system is stable. Can we prove that in this particular case, h of t is also bounded by some constant? Let's see, we're calling it capital M, right? So this would be capital M. Another way to think about this in concept is if I have a system and I tell you that it's stable, is it possible that the impulse response could take on an infinite value? Oh, 
Okay, so let's think about it. There are many ways to think about this, but let's think about it mathematically. So let's say that I have, I'm calculating the magnitude of y of t. The magnitude of y of t, let me write this in a different color. What we're essentially going to prove here is we're going to prove that in this particular case, we can show that h of t uh, is also bounded by some constant m. Okay. So in this particular case, let's start with the left-hand side. We have the magnitude of y of t. And if I write the magnitude of y of t, well, I can simply substitute in my output. In this particular case, just as so you know, it's an LTI system stability. Everything we're discussing today is LTI because convolution holds the mapping from input to output. So I have an LTI system. Therefore, I know how to write y of t, right? I know what to substitute in. I can simply substitute in minus infinity to infinity of x of tau h of t minus tau d tau. And this particular equation is also equal to integral of minus infinity to infinity of h of tau x of t minus tau d tau, right? And we were able to get from here to here because of the commutativity property, com. Now, let's look at the next line. This next line is a trick that you'll see. Uh, maybe your TA will go over it with you more in discussion. But essentially, if I have a signal, if I'm looking at the inner product of two signals and I look at their magnitude, this is going to be less than or equal to the magnitude of each individual signal. So this is something that we often call the triangle inequality. very closely related to Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which basically tells you that if I'm looking at, let's say the length of this, this is gonna be, let's say um, C, and I have A and I have B, the length of C or the magnitude of C is gonna be less than the magnitude of A plus the magnitude of B. In this particular case, if you think of this as a vector space, those of you who have taken linear algebra, C is going to be the summation of A and B. So we can say that the summation of A plus B is less than A plus B, less than or equal to. The only time that this would be equal is if A and B are essentially collinear, right? If A and B are collinear, then A plus B would have the exact same length. So that's why we have a less than or equal to. So this is the famous triangle inequality. And you can adapt the triangle inequality anytime you see an inner product, you can immediately think about triangle inequality or Cauchy-Schwartz. If you get a question like this on the exam, we will go over the triangle inequality or Cauchy-Schwartz on the exam so that it's self-contained. But for the moment, let's assume that we can use that property. And that will bring us to the following, right? This is the magnitude of both signals multiplied with each other, the inner price, this is a summation of all the signals multiplied by with each other, is going to be less than or equal to Okay, so you end up having something like this. Now, in this particular case, we know that this quantity is going to be less than or equal to mx. Right, we're just going to substitute in the definition here of mx. 
times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of h of tau d tau and therefore if this is to be bounded right so if this is to be bounded remember this is describing y of t right so we know that this has to be bounded by my so if this is to be bounded by my then what we want to happen is that this this guy here can't be has to be less than infinity okay, this can't be infinity so if this guy is less than infinity then what that's saying is that effectively if integral minus infinity to infinity of h of tau d tau is less than or equal to mh is less than infinity, then it follows that there exists some constant my such that h is stable. So your system is stable if the impulse response itself has a stability with some constant mh. Uh, one way to think about this is that if you put an unstable impulse response into a system, you're not guaranteed to get out a stable system. OK, the next property, remember, all these properties are just like multiplication. So the next property we'll discuss is associativity. So in this particular case, imagine that I had some f convolved with g convolved with h. Now, associativity tells us that the order of doing this doesn't really matter. Right? I could equivalently do f convolved with g first and then convolve that result with h. So it might help to look at an example from multiplication. If I have three times two times four, this is equal, right? So this equals three times eight, and this equals 24. This is equivalent to doing three times two times four, which equals six times four equals 24. Right. So this is a very similar property that we had for multiplication. Now we're going to have that same property in convolution. So in this particular case, this is exactly the same statement here. And our goal is to actually go and prove this out. So let's write a quick proof of how we might do this. We may run out of space on this page, so I'll try to write a little small. Our first step is let's just go and rewrite this more formally in our formal notation. It'll just help us keep track of things. So our more formal notation was f convolved with g convolved with h of t. Okay. It's some function which is the output of the convolution of g and h. This enables us not to go and mix and cross contaminate. And essentially, our goal is to show that this is going to equal f convolved with g of t convolved with h of t, right? That's going to be our goal. And in order to get to that goal, we need to start from the left-hand side, and hopefully we'll end up what's on, what's on the right-hand side. So let's remove this, and let's start from the left-hand side here and see what this is going to be equal to. So if I write this in the integral form, in the expanded form, right? This is going to be an integral over minus infinity to infinity of some signal f of tau 1. That's going to be convolved with this other signal. This other signal is going to be called g 
star h. And the arguments here originally would be t, so it would be t minus tau 1. Hopefully, this is clear from the previous examples we've gone through in the class. So now we can get this equation in integral form. Let's try to go and re rearrange it in the integral domain so that we get that output that we desire. All right, so now if I look at this, I'm going to need to expand out what is in blue here. I'm going to need to somehow expand it out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out integral minus infinity to infinity. Once again, I have f of tau 1. Now this expression in blue is going to take on a different form. I'm going to have a bracket here. And this is going to be another convolutional integral. Because it's an integral within an integral, I'm going to have to use a different notation. right? I can't use tau 1. I'm going to have to use a different dummy variable g of tau 2 right, times h of t minus tau 1 minus tau 2 d tau 2. And this whole thing is still within the other integral, so I have to write out d tau 1. So if I just look and stare at this, one of our goals is going to be in red, let us set tau 2 equal to some tau 3 minus tau 1. Okay. So if this holds, then tau 3 equals tau 1 plus tau 2. So now if we apply this here, we can take this equation and actually get up to the integral minus infinity to infinity f of tau 1 times now in bracket in blue. So what you're going to see is that the introduction of this dummy variable tau 3 is going to allow us to write down the argument to h in a less unwieldy form. Right? As we saw in the previous proof, we don't like to deal with too many arguments. Right? We don't have this argument in our associativity. So we want to get this away from h and bring it down to two arguments, which we use using a dummy variable tau 3. So in this particular case, this is once again going to equal the integral from minus infinity to infinity of g of, so tau 2, if I look at it, tau 2 is described right here. So tau 2 equals tau 3 minus tau 1 times h of t minus, in this particular case, this is nothing but tau 3 okay, that we see from this equation right here. Now, the integral is going to be taken over the third dummy variable. Right? We're going to do the convolution over a different dummy variable. And on the outside, we'll have d tau 1. This uh, form is fairly common where you're totally allowed to do your integrations over, it doesn't matter what index your tau is. You can make up new dummy variables to do your convolution over. OK, so that red arrow tells us how we get from, um, now we have, through by using the tau 3 dummy variable, we have g and h both with two arguments. So now what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to have the g with two arguments somehow go and play with the f. And what we can do is we can, in particular, change the order of integration. So let's give it a try. Okay, so let me just write equals, equals. And once again, we used tau 3 to get from here to here. Now we're going to have another equals. This is going to equal. minus infinity to infinity, bracket, OK. 
Okay, so what have we done here? Well, what we've done is we've just changed the order of integral sides, which is once again, completely kosher in this particular case. In this, uh, in this case, even though we're integrating with it over, so the blue integral uh, is over d tau three. So I'm perfectly capable of moving f of tau one into that integral because it's a constant with it. So now if I write it in this form, you can see that we're already very close to proving what we need to do. Now we have F and G within the bracket and that's being convolved with H. So we just need to simplify this briefly. So if we simplify this, we can write this as Now remember that this piece here, if I look at this piece here, what is that? Well, that is nothing but F convolve with G over some domain now, which is tau three, right? F convolve with G over the domain of tau three. And if I'm writing this rigorously, I'm gonna use the brackets there, okay. multiplied now, by h of t minus tau three d tau three. And this is equal to f convolve with g convolve with h. Okay, so in doing this, what we've been able to do is we've been able to actually go out and prove associativity. I've skipped one small step here that you can do if you're even more rigorous uh, due to lack of space. Uh, you can essentially get the dummy variable tau three out of this so that you can more rigorously write the convolution, but hopefully this gives you the gist of the manipulations that you can do. Now, what's super interesting is that you can also combine associativity and multiplicativity. So for example, we can combine associativity and community such that if I have, for example, F convolve with G convolve with H, well, this is nothing, you know, again, because it's commutative, um, right, it's commutative, then I'm perfectly capable of writing this as F convolved with H convolved with G, right? Because I can group these because it's associative, then I can just swap these because convolution within the brackets is commutative, and that gives me what's on the right-hand side. Okay. So once again, this is F, Convolve with G, convolve with H. And you can apply this and get almost any rearrangement that you want. This could also be equal to G, convolve with F, convolve with H, or almost any rearrangement all the way up until H, convolve with G, convolve with H. As we'll see later in this lecture, this property actually has profound practical impact. All right, convolution is also distributed, just like multiplication. Remember that we might have three times four plus two, and this is gonna equal three times four plus three times two, which equals 18 right, for multiplication. Now for convolution, the same thing holds. F convolved with 
in parentheses g plus h equals f convolved with g plus f convolved with h. So one way to prove this is just once again to go through the definition of convolution. So if we start from the left hand side, we have f convolved with g plus h and the whole thing is a function of t. So if I expand it into a convolutional integral, this is what I get. And you can very clearly see that I can split the convolutional integral in half and simply write it as this form. So this is one of the easiest properties to prove. OK, so now we've gone through some elementary proofs. Um, it might be useful, in case this comes up on a homework or exam, to see if we can ask maybe a different proof, which you can use some of the properties we've discussed to attempt. Um, once again, this question also has practical impact, so I'll first introduce some context. So over the past, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, we've seen basically the, something that looks like an algebra of signals. Uh, just like addition or multiplication, uh, we see a lot of the properties holding for convolution, like distributivity, associativity, commutativity, and so on. Multiplication is super closely related to convolution in particular, so one might question whether other things from multiplication also apply. So in multipl multiplication, we have a concept known as the multiplicative identity. What it says is if I have a number like a and I multiply it by one, for any number a, if I do this, I'm always going to get out a. Now, it turns out that we have a very similar identity for convolution. If I take any signal x of t and I convolve it with a Dirac, I'm always going to get back x of t, always. And so the check your understanding question is, please offer a proof that this is indeed the case. And as, we, as you pause the video, or before you pause the video, let me give you a quick hint, which is that you should be applying properties like commutativity and sifting that we learned about before in trying to prove this. So feel free to pause the video and then rejoin us in a moment. OK, welcome back. So let's see how we would attempt the proof. In general, whenever you're being asked to attempt proofs, a really good way to look at it is to start with the left-hand side. The goal is to go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, right? So take a clean sheet of paper and write out the left-hand side in, in a proof. So the left-hand side here is x of t convolved with delta of t. So all I do is I write out the left-hand side. Now, when I break it down, the next goal is to see if I can somehow expand or rearrange the left-hand side, work it like a piece of clay so that you get back to the right-hand side. So if I want to take the left-hand side, how would I expand it? Well, one way to expand it is we know that this operation is convolution. So instead of just writing it with a star, let's write it in an integral form, as we have done in the previous proofs. This is going to equal the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x x of tau delta of t minus tau d tau. Right, this is just by definition of convolution. And these. So if I look at this uh, and I want to rearrange it, one thing I can look at doing is I can look at commutativity here. So if I apply commutativity, Let's apply the com property. Then I'm going to get to a form that looks like this. Oops. Delta of tau. All right, so I get this form that looks something like this. Now, if I stare at this, it becomes very familiar to me. I can immediately see how to simplify this. 
uh, remember from a previous lecture and also from the hint that you're given the sifting property. Your friend delta, when it, whenever it's an integral, remember that it allows you to drastically simplify whatever else is an integral with it. So in this case, uh, x can be simplified because we don't need to worry about x when delta is zero, right? Because the integral is just going to be zero. So delta is actually almost always zero, except at tau equals zero. So we only need to worry about x when tau equals zero. So in this case, we can simplify using the sifting property. So tau equals zero. So this equals x of t minus zero d tau. Okay. And just to simplify this further, let's instead of writing t minus zero, we can just write x of t d tau. Now, because my integral is with respect to tau, I can very easily just pop the x out of the integral. Right, this is x of t integral minus infinity to infinity of delta of tau d tau. And now it just follows from one of the other properties I've learned about the integral of a delta of Dirac. Remember that the integral of Dirac always equals 1. So I can write this as x of t because this equals 1. And so now I've gone from the left-hand side here to the right-hand side, and this is a valid proof. OK, so hopefully that was uh, fairly straightforward for most of you. It turns out that we can do pretty amazing things with the Dirac delta function. So the Dirac delta function gives us the identity, right? The identity element. x convolved with Dirac of t equals x. But we can do some more special things. What happens if we take x and then convolve it with a shifted Dirac? Well, it turns out that if the Dirac was shifted, instead of, right, instead of x of t convolved with Dirac of t, we're going to convolve it with Dirac of t minus td, some delay time. So in this particular case, I get almost the same thing as the identity, except I get the shifted identity. I get a delay in my system. So here's the proof. It's actually the exact same proof. In order to prove that this holds, right? if you wanted to check your understanding, you can cover up the rest of this slide. But how would you prove that this holds? Well, the first thing you would do is you would take your left-hand side, and you would rewrite it on a clean piece of paper like we have done here. So we've written the left-hand side here. Then you would expand it using your properties of convolution. And you can expand it into this integral. Now, what we can do is, as we've seen in the previous proofs, we can either do some form of substitution if we wanted, or we could simply directly do sifting. So in this particular case, here I've written this out, right? Once again, this is the equation from right there, just rewritten. And you can follow the proof along. We know that tau, right, in this particular case, this argument here has to equal zero, right? So therefore, t minus td minus tau equals zero. Therefore, tau equals t minus td. And so what I can do is I can simply substitute this tau for here. And that's what, exactly what I've done to get to this next line. So now that x is no longer a function of tau, we simply apply what we did before to pop it out of the integral. And then we have, are left with an integral over Dirac, which is 1, and we get this answer. OK. So interestingly, convolution can also be used to implement not just delay, but also integration. So one, uh, we've seen this in a previous lecture. But basically, if I want to integrate a signal x from minus delta to some time t, all I need to do is take x of t and convolve it with u of t, the step function. And so once again, if you want, you can prove this. If you really like, you can start from the left-hand side and simplify. And basically, if you want to do this at home, you are going to exploit the fact that u of t minus tau is equal 
to essentially one if this is positive. So that means by definition, T has to be greater than tau, right? And zero if T is less than tau. So you're welcome to do that integration. And if you want, you can put greater than or equal here. So given these properties of convolution, we are also able to rederive existing properties uh, like linearity and time invariance that we've learned about. For example, time invariance uh, convolution is linear because for any signals x1 and x2 and all constants alpha and beta, the homogeneity and additivity property both hold, as you can see. Okay. So you can, at home, derive these, derive that indeed convolution is linear by just using basics of commutativity as well as a distributive property. Similarly, we can also use the time invariance of convolution, right? If we delay uh, the input, time invariance means if we shift the input, we shift the output. So in a convolution system, if we shift the input, shift the output, we're going to get that if I put in x of t minus t minus some capital delay capital T, then the output will be uh, y of t minus capital T. So you can see how you would prove this. One strategy, perhaps you've already thought about it, but one strategy that you could use is you know that a delay by the amount of t is convolution with a Dirac. So if you do that, you'll actually see that you're able to prove time invariance. Convolution has other nuanced properties. And if we have time, I'd like to go over an industry example, uh, which I'll kind of just make up on the fly. But before we start, let me begin by talking about cascades. Cascades are when you have multiple systems that chain together. And I think one of your homeworks dealt with this topic. So if you have a cascade, then the order of the systems is not critical. And in particular, due to associativity, I can model this as a composite system. Right, in this particular case, uh, this equation here, x convolved with f, all convolved with g, is equal to just some x convolved with h. And to see this, here's a block diagram. It's totally valid to say, take x, first convolve with f, and then convolve the result with g to get y. These two systems can also be combined together, f convolved with g, to give you a new system, h of t. Um, we can immediately see the practical impact of doing this. Uh, one practical impact is that if we, if we are in industry and we're trying to do multiple image processing steps, it's equivalent to combining them. And so we can save on resources, whether they're computer resources or heat resources or material resources. We can extend this a little bit further by also having swapping. Right? Due to commutativity, I can totally swap the order of my systems. I could do x convolve with f and then convolve with g, or I could do x convolve with g convolve with f. Right? And both will give me uh, the output y. These operations, like a lot of operations that we deal with in signal processing, such as introducing delays to signals, introducing integration to signals, differentiating signals, all these properties. Uh, commute. So the order that I do them is not important. And sometimes you'll see that you get a much better speed up if you choose the right order. Okay, so let me give you just a couple practical examples. So practical example one. Let's pretend that I'm doing some denoising to a signal. So I have x, it goes into a denoiser, and then I'm going to downsample the signal to get y. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's say that you have to upload a homework assignment. And your the image that you're uploading for your homework like is like a plot or whatever. It's a large plot that's very noisy. So the plot might be like, let's say, a megapixel, so a thousand by a thousand. 
Right? So that's like a million pixels. So I have a million pixels, and then I need to denoise those million pixels. And then it turns out that your website that you upload this plot to only accepts images of size 256 by 256. So now you have to downsample uh, the image by some factor. Okay. So you're downsampling each dimension by a quarter, and you're ending up with 1 16th the number of pixels. Now, the problem in this particular case is that the denoiser that you have run is now running on the full image. So what you could have potentially done if the systems were LTI was you could take X, you could first downsample it, then you could denoise it to get Y. And these two would be equal. Okay. Now your denoiser algorithm, it only needs to run on a small size image. So the overall system uses less resources. Another example is telescopes. Sometimes f and g can be written as two different lenses. This could be like a big lens. This could be a small lens. And just in, in the mechanical engineering of things, it might be easier to have your input, which is the light from a star, go into the small lens first and then go into the big lens. For example, this could be useful if your telescope is very long. Maybe you could say that like the end of the telescope, which is far away from the input. So let's say you're on a spaceship. Here's your spaceship. Um, let me draw this as like a space shuttle. Okay, so you have this space shuttle and, and on the space shuttle, you have a telescope. And a telescope has two lenses, which both process light from a faraway star. Now, in this particular case, maybe one lens is F and one lens is G. By the way, it turns out that lenses are actually LTI systems. And so this is not just a theoretical example. This actually does happen. So in this case, I have the lenses being uh, two systems, F and G. And it turns out that we said F is the big lens. Well, if I put the big lens far away from the space shuttle, it's going to affect the inertia. Lenses can be really heavy. They're like huge pieces of glass. So the big lens is going to affect the dynamics of the space shuttle. It's harder to clean because it's so far away. You have to do a spacewalk, whereas G is almost you know, right up against the airlock. So because I know from EE102, it doesn't matter mathematically whether F comes first or G comes first. I can adapt my system to satisfy what other constraints we have whether it was computer constraints or mechanical constraints as described here. So the properties that we're discussing about systems, although it sounds obvious and elementary, they can have a profound impact on practical applications. So uh, one other practical application. Suppose that you are um, out in space. Let's, let's give you another example. And you're trying to calibrate a camera. So you have a camera, which is a system. This is a system H. And you're looking, you're trying to understand how the camera is calibrated, right? What is its impulse response? You know that it's LTI, but you don't know how, what its impulse response is. Now, if you're out in space, you might not have the resources to create an impulse to the camera. So to create an impulse to the camera, what you would do is you would look at a point light source, like a star or something similar. Let's just pretend you're on the surface of the moon or whatever, and you don't have access to looking at stars. Okay, you're, or you're in some unforgiving environment, you can't look at stars. But it turns out that you can look at the transition between two different colors. So you might be able to look at like a uh, transition between black and white, right? You can find these transitions anywhere you look, like on your keyboard, you look at your computer keys. That's like a transition between light and dark. So I look at my computer keys, and this actually forms a step function. So I can take a picture of a step function, but I can't take a picture of an impulse. So what does that mean? What that means is that I don't have the impulse response given to me. And remember, previously in this class, we said that if I have a system H, the way to get the impulse response is to put in an impulse. Right? I must put in an impulse to my system. I have to go and put in a Dirac into H, and this gives me the impulse response, which is H of T. What if we don't have access to a Dirac? in the real world, right, for our system. We don't have that ability. 
it turns out that you can use the properties of commutativity that we discussed to actually go ahead and put in a step edge into your impulse, into your system. So you put in a step edge into your system, and then you can simply differentiate the step edge to get the impulse response. So let's go over it on this slide. So remember from the previous class that if I look at the integral of the Dirac, it's going to be the step function. And the derivative of the step function is going to be the Dirac. So let's take a look at this first block right here. What I'm going to do is I'm putting in a step function into a system. That system is a differentiator system. So that differentiator is going to give me the impulse. And now I have the impulse that goes into a system to give me the output. But equivalently, I could have put the step function into a system and then differentiated the output of that system to get me the impulse response. Both of these things could have been done. In this way, we don't actually have to realize an ideal impulse, response, impulse function, which is a mathematical construct. We can approximate it with step functions and doing a differentiation on the output. OK, let's, uh, we had some students email me about uh, question 1b on homework number three. And so let's very briefly just go over what that might look like. So remember that in homework number three, you're being asked a question to show whether this is linear or not. Okay. So your check your understanding question is to show whether y of t equals d over dt one half x of t squared is linear or not. So check your understanding. Is this system linear? So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to square x, and then we're going to pass it to a scaling by 1 half, and then we're going to differentiate it. And the order of doing this doesn't matter if it was LTI. So there are a lot of ways to go and check if the system is linear. One way to do it is to remember the easiest way that I often look at proving if a system is linear or not. There's two ways, right? It, it has to satisfy homogeneity, has to satisfy additivity. So I always look first at homogeneity because it's super easy to actually prove. So one way to do that is first, if this is what I'm given and I want to prove that this is linear, the first step that I might do is I just rewrite this in a simpler form. I can rewrite this system just by applying the derivative as x of t times d over dt of x of t. And we got here by essentially understanding functional derivatives, right? It's a derivative of a function. So you may want to review your high school calculus if this doesn't make sense, but you can simplify this equation as follows. Now, the simplest thing, once you have the equation in the easy form to analyze, is to apply some sort of homogeneity. Okay. So homogeneity just tells you that if I'm going to put in a scaled version of the input, I should get a scaled version of the output. So instead of x of t, let's take ax of t into our system s. I don't know if the system is linear or not, so I'm just going to I'm actually going to draw this just so it doesn't. We, we always draw even nonlinear systems with boxes, but just to avoid confusion, I'll draw it as a cloud. It goes into some system S. And that system is, it's going to give me A of Y of T if the system is linear. And it's going to give me something else if nonlinear. So in this particular case, let me actually really quickly take back what I said. It's going to give you a of y of t, but this doesn't necessarily mean that the system is linear, right? So let's say we put in a equals 0. In this case, we get 0 as the output. So it needs to hold for all values of a, just to be clear. Okay. 
uh, when you test it, you can only test one value of A. So typically, you're often trying to uh, quickly negate the system. You're actually really trying to do the following. You're trying to put AY in. And if it's not equal, then you know that the system is, uh, is not limited, right? So if it's not equal to A, Y, T. So this is the first check I always do when checking if a system is linear or not. It's very easy to prove nonlinearity by simply putting this in. So we know from our gut feeling that this is nonlinear, right? Because it's not a linear function, X of T is squared. So let's just verify this by plugging and chugging. So from number two, what I can do is I can say that y a of t okay, is going to equal a, a x of t dt. Right? I've put in a x t. And this, I can move the a outside of the derivative because it's a constant. So I get a squared x of t times d over dt x of t. And remember that d over dt, so x of t times this right here equals y of t. So this equals a squared y of t. So if I put in a x into my system, I get back not a y, but I get back a squared of y. Okay. So the system, by virtue of that, is nonlinear, right? Because this is not equal to a y. So this is a quick way to check if a system is linear. If you want to be more complete, uh, once you have done this, you are done with the question, right? You have solved the question because you have shown that the system does not satisfy homogeneity. Now, you could also try this with additivity if you want, but in general, it's super easy to check with homogeneity. Oftentimes, what I do to check if a system is linear, if I just look at it, one way I do a shortcut to check if a system is linear, let's say I have a system, um, this is another question. So I have another question. I have like some output y of t equals 255 minus x of t. Is this system linear? It looks pretty linear to me, actually. It looks pretty linear, so you can get confused pretty easily. This operator, by the way, is called the image polarity system. It actually takes like a black and white image and makes it a white and black image, an 8-bit image. Right, 8 bits is 255, so if you flip the binaries, like the, you know, bright things are now dark, light things are now light. So it basically flips the color scheme of your black and white image. That's what the system is doing. So the question is, is the system linear? Well, one of the things I do to check if a system is linear is I see, does it satisfy homogeneity? And I can right away see that it does not, right? Because let's say that I put in a x of t, for a equals zero, right? So I put in zero. So if I have a system like this, if I put zero into the system, I should expect zero as the output. This, this should hold for any linear system. I put in zero, I get zero as the output. I know that in this particular case, y of t equals 255. So therefore, this is not linear. This is not linear. So even if there's no exponent to the x, don't get confused, go through your process. So my process typically is the first thing I do is I put in zero and see if I get out zero. Then I put in ax, see if I get out a y. And my third step typically is then I just go full bore. And I just put in ax, uh, ax plus bx prime. So I test uh, homogeneity and additivity at the same time 
and put that into my system. So each of you may have a different process. Um, that's just mine because it's super quick to rule out if systems are linear or non-linear. Hopefully this is helpful and good luck with the rest of your homework.